Welcome to First and Future Connecting in Crisis. This is a weekly program of the Institute for Emerging Issues at NC State University. It is a joint Zoomcast Facebook Live webinar sponsored by the home improvement retailer Lowe's. We thank them for making today's shows and the shows over the next month possible. I'm Leslie Boney with the Institute for Emerging Issues, and each week on this program, we look at critical emerging issues related to the global pandemic. Things like how do we get K through 12, community colleges and universities all online, students learning and professors teaching. How can we make sure everybody has a chance to work from home and get telehealth services? How do we overcome critical food and hunger issues that are brought up by the global pandemic? What does recovery look like for small business? How are we getting the word out to those who are least able to hear? We thank you for joining. This is your chance to listen to and ask questions of terrific guests, people we like to try to find that we consider to be realistic optimists who are working to address some of the most important issues that are raised by the crisis. Today's topic is entrepreneurship. During today's show, we'd like to take on these issues, what's happening to our state's startup community that plays such a critical role in our economy. Why is it so important right now to have entrepreneurs among us? As so many of us face job transitions, is this a potential inflection point for those who've been kicking around an idea in the back of their head and just haven't gotten around to it? Is this a time to rethink the state's economic development priorities? It's an issue of long-term interest to the Institute for Emerging Issues. Most recently, our Innovate NC program led by Sarah Hall worked with uh, communities across the state of North Carolina that were not Charlotte and the Triangle, looking for ways to create entrepreneurial ecosystems. What would it look like if we had the strength and ability in every community to support a vibrant entrepreneurial community? So we have a long-term interest in this subject and we wanna get right to it today. We've got a great set of guests, all of whom have been entrepreneurs or are currently entrepreneurs or are helping entrepreneurs. Uh, Donald Thompson, the CEO of Walk West, is a serial entrepreneur. Walk West is a digital marketing firm based in the Triangle that has been recognized as the fastest growing agency in North Carolina in 2018 and 2019. Tom Rue, the president and CEO of NC Idea with a background at the Kauffman Foundation as a, and as a serial entrepreneur himself. The NC Idea Foundation is dedicated to finding ways to identify young, talented companies, getting them the startup capital they need to survive and thrive. And Noah Wilson, who's director of the Growing Outdoors Partnership with Mountain Biz Works in Western North Carolina. We are excited to have all of them. Let me just start off with a question for all of you. Donald and Tom, you've both come through crises as company CEOs in the past. What is the same this year and what is different from the ones that you've seen in the past? Donald, maybe you could start. Sure, and, and thanks for having me. Uh, one of the things that's the same is certainly how do you perform under significant duress, right? It's one thing when you have lots of time to think, plan strategies and different things. And right now there is an accelerated clock, if you will, to make decisions, execute against plans and truly understand if you're serving your market and failure is very real and quick. And so that's one of the things that is, that is the same, excuse me, between 2007, eight and nine uh, and today. Uh, one of the things that is radically different, and, and I use that term very specifically, radically different is because everyone is experiencing fear, uncertainty and doubt at the same time at a magnitude that nobody has ever dealt with before. And that means from our political leaders, our business leaders, there's literally no game plan to rely on. There's no book or seminar that you can go to. So creativity and innovation now more than ever is going to be a superpower because you've got to be able to do that real time. Tom, what's the same and what's different from your past experience with crises? Well, I think the uncertainty obviously is the same. You know, the, the grand notion of what's tomorrow going to look like. Um, and how do I you know, deal with that uncertainty? What's different is um, in both the financial crisis and post 9-11, um, those felt like discrete events so that most of the you know, society had this notion that we would be on the other side of it at some point and get back to some, some form of normalcy. But now, you know, uh, in some of the circles 
you know, we support, we're talking about, okay, what are you going to do in the winter when the second wave comes, right? And what if there isn't going to be a funded PPP at that time? So it's an extension of the uncertainty amped up, you know, exponentially that is unprecedented, you know, from anything I've experienced. Thank you. Noah, you've been talking with, not up close and personal, but, but pretty intimately with a lot of people that you're working with uh, in the western part of North Carolina, what sorts of things are, are foremost on their mind right now? What's really hammering them over the head right now? You know, I think it is that sense of shared uncertainty and of will we be able to spin back up and get enough runway that if something else happens again, we can make it through that period. And I think there's a lot of need for folks to constantly be pivoting and recognizing that even their best laid plans kind of have to be let go. And I think there's, it's, it's really what we're seeing is grief. I think naming it's really important. People are grieving right now for their plans, for what they felt their futures would look like, what they felt their companies, their retirements would look like. And so I think what we're dealing with a lot right now is those early stages of grief and then hopefully be able to get folks through those stages to be able to then move forward and then be able to look into the future with an excitement in their eyes again. All right, we're gonna be talking a lot about how to get through that grief over the next few minutes and we'll come back to each of you. I just wanted to give a little bit of grounding to folks about what's going on, um, what was going on in North Carolina when it came to entrepreneurship before this happened. Uh, Tom Rue used to work for the Kauffman Foundation. They do a report every year that looks at the rate of entrepreneurship that goes on in uh, different states across the nation. And one of the really interesting statistics they have is the number of people who start a, uh, an entrepreneurial company every month. And so in North Carolina, the rate is one out of 370 adults. So every month, one out of every 370 adults in North Carolina before this crisis was starting a business. And statistically, nationally, we know that about 20% of those failed, which means that 80% survived the first year. We have some stats on North Carolina that are put out by the North Carolina Board of Science and Technology and Innovation every year. And they show us some interesting facts about where North Carolina ranks in terms of entrepreneurship. Uh, this is on a normalized basis, so it doesn't depend on the size of the state. It's based on the, uh, the ratio for each state. So among all states, North Carolina is number 20 in entrepreneurs per 100,000 people. Uh, we are 20th at the rate at which we patent. Uh, number 14 in venture capital. That's a little bit of a misleading statistic because roughly 70% of venture capital goes to three places. And so the, a lot of the states are way behind Silicon Valley and Austin and Boston. Uh, we are number 16 in academic research. We do a lot of that, but it's because we have so much of it. So on a normalized basis, we're at number 16. And we're number 16 in the percentage of college educated population that moves here, which is one indicator of uh, entrepreneurial vibrancy. We also have a rich tradition as tinkerers and experimenters. Uh, we're the place that tested out the first plane. We have loved for years to tune up fast cars to run moonshine. Uh, we've been at Cheerwine and Pepsi and Krispy Kreme donuts, but also Vicks VapoRub, the Gatling gun, the barcode, and possibly this time, a uh, vaccine for COVID-19. This crisis is just no exception. It's a chance when a lot of entrepreneurs are grieving, but they're also going back to the drawing board and reimagining things. This pandemic, as all of our guests have already mentioned, is unprecedented in that it's hitting our entrepreneurs at the same time. If you look at global numbers, we just got the numbers on first quarter GDP uh, yesterday that came out showing us down 4.8% uh, uh, over the past quarter. And uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell said second quarter could be the worst quarter that we've had ever in U.S. history just because of the broad range of sectors that are impacted by this. A study by Startup Genome that came out last week found that 65% of startups across the globe are expected to run out of cash within six months. In North America, 84% uh, of startups have laid off employees. 
We also know that a lot of them though are gaining revenues and some of those are in the obvious sector. You'll see a picture of empty grocery store aisles there, but it's not just grocery, it's streaming services, uh, uh, huge amounts of sale, the increase in alcohol. I saw that sales of bush light were up 41% over the past couple of uh, months. Uh, cosmetics companies, fitness equipment companies, all those obviously have them. We're gonna hear about some others uh, over the course of this hour that are succeeding. So it's not all gloom and doom. Let me turn to you, Donald Thompson, uh, as a serial entrepreneur who's now CEO of a company. Um, what's the crisis been like for your company? How have you been dealing with this as it faces you every day? So a couple, a couple things come to mind. One, I'll look at it from our employee standpoint. Um, and in the creative space, and then also uh, Gen Z and millennials uh, in our firm, this is the first time that they've been really powerless, right? The young young people have gotten a, and grown up to a lot of choices, right? A lot of flexibility. And so this has been really confining. So there's been an emotional hit to our team in terms of that morale. Now, the positive side is that we found the winners. We found some folks that have really dug in and said, you know what? We can't control everything, but let's do every single thing, every moment we're working uh, to help our customers be successful. Because fortunately for us, we're in the digital space. So I tell people all the time, it's 10 times harder to win a deal right now, but we're blessed because we still can win a deal. So we're willing to fight that harder fight because we're still at least have opportunity for motion. And so to answer your question most specifically, we're having to be very dialed in to produce massive value with significant return for our clients right now for them to continue to spend money with us. And that's making us be very sharp in the campaigns that we run and the value that we produce. And so our people are blessed and helpful because they have enough to do to where we're not thinking about the negative all the time. And that is helpful from a mental health perspective and then also fighting through it. And then for our clients, they really are depending on us to produce our best work for them because it's, it's survive in advance in the business world right now. And, and everybody's fighting for attention span and to really make your brand resonate. And, and so we are, I would say, realistically optimistic about pushing through this thing and staying healthy. So even while you're facing this down as a CEO yourself, you're also taking a step back and reflecting and trying to provide some sort of perspective. You've written for entrepreneur.com and cnbc.com. And most recently, I saw an article you'd written for WRAL TechWire in which you tried to help other CEOs of startup companies gain some kind of perspective. And as, as you just said, you use that survive and advance methodology, that, that, that term that I think Jim Valvano maybe started back in 1983. Can you talk about what survive and advance means? So a couple of things, and, and thanks for putting up the slide. I really appreciate it. Number one, in the survival standpoint, uh, transparency is everything. Your team knows that you don't have all the answers. Tell them the ones you do have. And if you've got to make tough choices, be as, 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 as gracious with those tough choices as you can. Uh, the other thing is you have people that put money with you, your investors, your stakeholders, and they need to understand what your options are, right? And the other thing that I would say a lot of companies do during this time is that they underinvest in the things that can save them. And it's a little self-serving, but we think marketing matters. And especially in the digital footprint for companies, that's where the battle is going to be for attention span. So it's not the right time to cut as much as it is the right time to make sure that you're efficient. And then the other thing is innovation. What can you do differently, quickly, that adds value with the team that you already have in place, with the infrastructure you already have in place? From an advanced standpoint, and there is you know, reason to be optimistic as you push through, what are you doing to retool and reskill? And so The Startup Hacks by a friend of mine, David Gardner, is a great book for entrepreneurs to really think about what their behavior and education needs to be. The other thing that's important during this time is even when your clients aren't buying, even when your clients don't have as large a budget, become an educational source for the problems that they have so that when the tide turns, they remember how you cared for them during duress by teaching them, by training their team, by working with them. And then more now than ever, if you do not have CEO buy-in for the initiative that you're pitching, you do not have a chance because every nickel that is spent in organizations, large or small, is gonna to have to be approved, endorsed, and fully uh, committed to 
by the leadership of that organization. And so it's almost a waste of time if you're having sales calls that the CEO is not in or somebody that has the CEO's ear or buy-in to have that conversation. And then the final thing that I would say, and I think this is the most important thing for businesses, is you've got to figure out how to partner with other like-minded firms so that your client acquisition costs go down. So if you partner with somebody that has similar targets that you do, and you now can share leads, share lead generation, share best practices, a referral and a recommendation is more important now than any kind of other campaigns that you're trying to run. And partnerships are a great way to do that. And so those are a couple of things that I've, I've shared with entrepreneurs as we go. Say so that's some realistic optimism. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder to everyone that these slides will be available if you want to look at them later. And also a reminder that we are streaming this week on Facebook Live. So if you have friends, uh, they can uh, get on Facebook Live and join us as well. Uh, Donald, you're also a certified diversity executive and 80% of your employees are either uh, women or minorities. I wanted to share with folks some data that came out a couple of years ago from Alex Bell and Raj Chetty that really, it, it originally came out under the title of Lost Einsteins, but it was about the potential for entrepreneurship uh, that we have from uh, people of color and uh, women and their relative underrepresentation. So the study was long-term and basically it found that race, geography, and income all matter when it comes to entrepreneurship. Yep. And uh, all those can be uh, predictors that there will be less entrepreneurship among a particular person or a particular area. Uh, white children are three times more likely to become inventors right now. And then they did this really interesting projection where they, they said, if women, minorities, and low-income children all invented at the same rate as high-income white males, the American innovation rate would quadruple. Um, one other stat they mentioned was that if the rate of entrepreneurship between women and men improved at its current rate, in 118 years, women might start companies at the same rate as men. So when you, when you see those statistics, we know that this is a crisis that is disproportionately affecting lower income people and disproportionately affecting people of color and people on hourly wages. Why is this, how could this be an opportunity to change some of those numbers and really unleash a new set of people that haven't been innovating and starting companies at the same rate? And what would it take to do that? So a um, couple of layers to that, but I have a couple of thoughts that I can get to pretty quickly. One is from a health standpoint, it is really taught us that independent of our uh, race, our gender, our socioeconomic uh, position, that we're really in this together. And like, we can't escape the fact of how interconnected we all are. And so one of the clients that we just started to work with, uh, Biden Healthcare in Eastern North Carolina, uh, has signed on our firm to do some very targeted marketing uh, for people of color in Eastern North Carolina. And so one of the things is, how do you think about health and wellness education differently because it impacts us all? And so that's one thing that it, it, in this crisis, it's gonna bring us a little closer together. The second thing, I truly believe, and I've seen this in our work in the DNI space, that people are now ready to attack these issues. What they need now more than ever are roadmaps and advocates to show them how to institute DNI programming into their everyday life and move away from the fact of kind of the blame game of the historical things that got us there. But really to your point, what are the innovation measures that can bring us forward? And finally, how the DNI construct can really move the bottom line. Because ultimately in order to grow and maintain a business, it has to be a profitable business. So in order for a C-level executive to care about DNI, it has to have the moral imperative aligned with the economic imperative. So how do we do something about it? is we have to have business leaders that can speak about both, the right thing to do, and then why it affects my business in a positive way. For Walk West, I have the access to great ideas because of our natural diversity, and so that we can pinpoint and grow on a problem different than many, because it's just built into the fabric of what we do. Your company's name, the current company, Walk West, is sort of a metaphor, imagining people walking west, exploring new territories, things like that. What's a company that's maybe inspired you 
just watching them from a distance or from up close over the past uh, month or so? That's a that's a really, really good question. I, I wouldn't say it's any one company. I would say it's the characteristics of leaders that drive companies. And here's what I mean by that. It is the characteristic of leaders that want to forge ahead, that are trying to do something different and radical and not letting the naysayers keep them down, that are willing to push it forward, but more importantly, bring others along with them. So there's a lot of companies I admire, but the thing that gets my admiration are leaders that are willing to forge ahead, but bring others with them, right? Mentor and bring and rise up other talents. From a football analogy, coaches that I admire are ones that win, but also have a coaching tree of other people they taught and that they brought forward. That's the most impressive thing to me about leadership and companies is what do you do with the success opportunities that you have? And that's what I try to emulate and be helpful. Donald Thompson, we'll come back to you in just a second, but both you and Tom Rue uh, have a coaching tree already. Uh, there are already people that are uh, uh, fans of yours and, and have learned something from you. Tom, I would also describe you as an optimistic realist. And in this crisis, you've talked about the huge cash crunch that people are facing, but also the opportunities that they have. Can you just say a little bit about how this is a crisis and it is an opportunity? Sure. I mean, I'm going to just piggyback on some of the things that Donald said, you know, understanding that entrepreneurial potential is equal in everyone. Everyone has the same potential to do great things, entrepreneurially speaking. What isn't equal is access to the resources, to the networks, uh, to the opportunities, the innovation to act on that entrepreneurial potential. So, you know, we have focused on and, and, Thanks to leadership from the staff and the board, you know, we had put a stake in the ground that said no less than half of all of our time, treasure, and talent has to be in service of women, minorities, and folks from our rural communities. And so we've labored forth it through all of our programming to make sure that we're out there helping people get that access, get those resources uh, as tight as they are right now, but you know, really making it an effort and more importantly, a priority for the foundation, because it's one thing to say it's a value, it's another thing if you're gonna really put it, put your numbers out there. And, and I'll give you an example of the, the last um, grant announcement that ironically we just made last week, the 16 uh, micro grants, over 75% went to women, minorities, and folks in our rural communities. You know, that's how we move the needle, but, uh, but it's no silver bullet, right? And since somebody else used a sports analogy, I'll use another one. It's five yards per carry. And we just have to show up every day grinding it out and trying to look for the people that have the desire, the potential, but they just need the access to help. That means as an organization, we need to have the empathy and place sufficient value on doing that and engaging the community that way. It's the idea is given out, uh, and I say given out, but Clearly, there was deep due diligence related to it, 148 grants over the past 14 years. You mentioned uh, 16 recent grants uh, to companies at what many people would say was the craziest time ever. How did you decide to move ahead with a grant cycle with this much uncertainty there? Well, it's, it's a couple. I mean, at the risk of being redundant, right, the need is greater now than ever before. So... If you're an organization that helps people realize their full entrepreneurial potential, um, I would argue that we need to be on the front line. We have the luxury of that mission. We have the privilege of that mission. So my bigger frustration isn't that we're still keeping up with our you know, grant schedule, which we absolutely are. We haven't um, postponed or delayed at all. Of course, we're accommodating to the new reality. So you know, when you have to sit through 32 Zoom interviews that go about 45 minutes a piece. That makes for some long days uh, sitting behind a screen, but you know, we did it. That my bigger frustration, my challenge, what is keeping me up at night is I see a path forward as clear as day that we could two to three X what we do in grant making because the need is that great and obviously even greater. And we simply don't have it. We are already as a foundation um, overspending is the, the term. You know, uh, private foundations are required by law to do 5% of net assets. And for the last four years, again, through the leadership of our board um, and the desire, frankly, of the staff who really wanted to have greater impact, we've been nearly doubling that rate. We can't triple that rate without 
compromising the long-term viability of the corpus, the endowment, and our you know long-term uh, sustainability as an organization. So you know we started uh, just recently a Partners in Purpose campaign um, to see if we can't engage more people to realize that sustaining, growing the startup ecosystem, that what we do today will manifest two years, three years, five years out for better or worse. So if we neglect it today, then that's, you know, that's the proverbial canary in the coal mine, economically speaking. If we neglect today, we'll pay the price for that tomorrow. If we invest today, we'll be the beneficiaries of that tomorrow. And so our challenge is really communicating and articulating that, that vision. I talked earlier this week, and one of the points you made is that some of our strongest companies in the U.S. were started during a recession or the depression. So I looked it up, and uh, in the Great Depression, we had Disney, which is still around, HP, which is still around. In the Great Recession, the one just 10 years ago, gosh, there's just a litany of amazing companies, uh, Kickstarter, Credit Karma, WhatsApp, Venmo, Groupon, Instagram, Uber, and your research at Kaufman and other places suggests that these aren't just anecdotes, that there's actual truth to that, that this can be really a, a foundational time to get a company started if you do it right. Yeah, that's, you know, put aside for a moment the, the human impact, right, of the uncertainty and, and all the suffering that's happening right now. And just being analytical for a second, um, you know, when just pre-COVID, right? Economy is super frothy. You ask any startup, number one thing that's holding back their uh, growth was access to talent. We couldn't find enough uh, talented people. You know, when you go through something like this, very talented people, unfortunately, will be losing their job, which means there will be access to very talented people to go into a startup. And it's a, it's a career opportunity for those folks to pivot and try something out of necessity that they wouldn't try necessarily otherwise. Um, and even though there's an initial short cash crunch over time, uh, private equity does uh, come back into the market. So capital does come in. Um, you just have to kind of work through the bargain hunters coming in first. Um, I see you put my slide up. So let me just talk to that very, very briefly. Where I think the biggest opportunity right now is, is really focusing on rethinking and redefining what economic development as a practice is to increase the focus on entrepreneurship. Before COVID, right, we already know from work from Gallup that 65% of the American workforce is not engaged in their work. And even more startling is that approximately 10% of the workforce is what uh, Gallup defines as uh, actively disengaged. That means 10% of the workforce goes in every day and does things against the interest of their employer, right? Again, pre-COVID, almost two and a half million people from Research Economic Innovation Group in North Carolina alone are living with um, severe economic distress in their life. And I cannot uh, even begin to fathom what that number is going to look like post-COVID, because that is certainly that's going to go up. And then perhaps I think the most concerning thing, especially as it applies to economic development practices, since the, you know, the last crisis, the big metro areas, approximately 51 or 54 per the Brookings report strategy of left behind places, um, indicated that the employment growth, right? We had a great concentration going into the urban areas, further gutting our rural communities and leaving them disinvested. Uh, and that's going to probably amplify again, uh, just more, you know, dire, in a more dire fashion. So we have to get ahead of that now. We have to look at what are the infrastructure things to support entrepreneurial development in these left behind communities. I know a, a topic that Leslie, you and I both commiserate over is you know, the infrastructure for broadband, for example. You know, we cannot say to some of these people that are gonna be losing their job right now in a rural community, well, you know, go ahead and start that business now you know, if you've got ostensibly dial up internet capacity. It's just not an option to say nothing of how it's impacting education and students trying to you know, learn from home, telemedicine and all those other things uh, that IEI has been publishing great work um, about. These are the things that we need to kind of look at. It's not sexy. It's not glamorous, but it's got great implications to how well and how easy we make it for people to start and grow great companies of economic potential. Uh 
question from Chris William. Do we approach this op this recovery with a different expectation, different strategy and tactics that this time the slowdown was man-made or an engineered recession? So is this, is this a different approach because of the nature of this particular challenge that we have? I'm thinking about uh, COVID specifically. Um, so in the past, there was an event and Donald mentioned this earlier, uh, there was an event and it was a discrete event and it happened and it was over. And now we have this uh, thing that is of indeterminate length and we can't exactly predict it. So do we need to think differently about this in some fundamental way? So I'll chime in quickly. Um, the answer is yes, right? And, and it's really a, a health crisis that aligns with business and, and also then aligns with just your own personal well-being, right, as individuals in the family. And the, the way forward, in, in my opinion, is we actually are going to hold our government leaders to a higher standard of readiness than ever before, independent of uh, Republican, Democrat, all, all of that stuff. What has occurred is we as a nation were not ready. And I don't think people are going to tolerate the lack of preparedness as a nation for this kind of event again. And so I think what's gonna change is people are gonna be paying more attention, right? To some of the infrastructure needs, right? That we have as a country to be ready for uncertain um, hits that we may take. And so I think that's gonna be a positive outcome to a pretty significant challenge. Thank you. Um, Tom, you talked about the potential for economic development policy to change in light of this. You're part of the governor's entrepreneurial council, and there are some recommendations that you had before the crisis. What do you think? So my observation would be that when it comes to economic development policy in the North Carolina, uh, we have some niche programs to encourage SBIR and STTR companies. We have some green power companies out there, but for the most part, the overwhelming amount of attention we pay is first to recruiting new companies to come into North Carolina, secondarily to holding on to existing companies, and as an afterthought only uh, to creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem that can support things. But what would you have us change? What do you think we should uh, change that could be productive in this crisis? I think uh, there's a couple of things I'll go through very quickly. The first being we need to value entrepreneurship in the startup ecosystem much greater than it's valued here. Um, you know, I have had the good fortune to do this work on a global scale and certainly all over the country. And I can tell you in other states, there's greater importance from a policy perspective placed on what entrepreneurs do for the economy, namely start the new, solve big problems, create jobs, again, Kaufman data, all net new job creation comes from companies less than five years old. So there's just a, there's a lack of understanding about that. Um, and I'm gonna refrain from my normal visceral reaction about that, I'm gonna try to be calm, um, that you know, policymakers need to invest in their own education to understand that better, right? If in the old model or the traditional model of what is euphemistically referred to as smokestack chasing, if we're willing to just, you know, throw billions of dollars of incentives, you know, to bribe, I mean, entice, you know, a company to come here, if we would take a fraction of that and invest it in the early stage ecosystem, you know, to distribute that through local and, you know, countywide governments for changing their economic development priorities. And that, I don't, and by the way, I am, I am not, um, casting aspersions on the attraction and retention model. There is a place for that, but I think it consumes a disproportionate amount of uh, resources for what it produces. And if we just collectively had the courage to invest for you know a five, 10 year period, we would start that virtuous cycle where we start seeing it you know, come back and paying dividends. And, I, and I've had the good fortune of seeing that firsthand. I mean, that was part of an effort in Northeast Ohio that did that back in 2004, you know, took tens of millions of dollars to get it going. Um, but they now have, you know, a $3 billion plus economic impact because of it. The organization that was originally, you know, supported through uh, charitable donations and tax revenues 
now has a quarter billion dollar you know, balance sheet. It, it can happen. We just have to have the political will and, and put the right people in positions of power that have the, you know, the authority and the willingness to go ahead and do that and realize that it's a bipartisan issue that everybody can embrace, right? As I go back to my earlier statement. Everybody has the same entrepreneurial potential. They just don't have the same access. So let's do that cross-platform and change the way we think about where we're willing to invest to include, not at the exclusion of, but to include entrepreneurship as a plank. Question from Peter Bishop, and let me use this as a transition. Uh, I'd like you to answer it, Tom, if you could, and then we'll turn to Noah for an answer as well. Uh, uh, Peter says, basically, local government is hurting right now. There's uh, huge hits to the budget, and local government may be interested in supporting entrepreneurship, but they're also interested in supporting corporate relocations. How do they um, do that? How do they allocate their money at this time when, when it's so limited? Right. Well, first thing I, I would just remind everybody is they're not mutually exclusive. I know it's we're saying how thin do we spread the peanut butter because it's a very limited amount. So I get that. Um, I think what you have to do is take an inventory of what startup ecosystem assets your community has. And I think that should inform how much of a finite budget you allocate to supporting that, right? I, this is gonna sound very clinical and cold and I'll apologize in advance if I create events, but there are some communities that just won't be able to pull it off. Despite the will to do it, there's just no center of gravity, so to speak. But there are plenty of communities that could create that. It just takes intentionality and getting people from the community that are entrepreneurially minded to be engaged and leading that activity and let them kind of drive it. And then have just open, honest, and if they have to be you know, public uh, debates, right? Let's put everything out, pour it all out on the table and say, where should the priorities be? And how can we you know, divvy up what money we do have? Uh, all the while hoping that again, our elected officials in Raleigh understand the need and start prioritizing adequately uh, resources for those communities that are hardly that are hit very hard. Noah, same question for you. Mountain BizWorks has been working to uh, make sure that businesses in Western North Carolina download every piece of the uh, PPP that's coming down, but you've also been able to draw on local resources that support the entrepreneurial community. Can you paint a portrait of, of the different local sources that are coming in and helping during this time? Sure, but let me also respond to what Tom was saying first, just really quickly. I think that the other piece of, why, of how you balance the attraction and the startup ecosystem is that peers matter. <clears throat> we look at Kitspo as a company that moved to Old Fort, North Carolina, which is a very small town, about 30 minutes east of Asheville. And they came to this town because, and they're, they're a startup from San Francisco that brought a pretty sizable workforce to a very small community. And they came to that time, they were attracted there because they had an entrepreneurial ecosystem, a peer group and a network that was really attractive and that felt like they wanted to be somewhere that was already moving, right? And so when you talk about balancing those two things, <clears throat> If you don't have a strong business environment in your community already, if you aren't growing and nurturing what's there and bringing up people who are kind of those startups and those businesses that are ready to grow in your community, it'd be very hard to attract other businesses to your place that because they won't see that they have peers and networks and you know talented employees because we deal from one another as part of the deal, right? Like there's all this stuff that is necessary to really be attractive. So all the billions you want won't bring someone there if they don't have anybody else to be with. And so I think we've done a great job and, you know, a lot of our North Carolina communities, I can speak to Western North Carolina in particular, of supporting the businesses that are already there right now. I know that, as we mentioned, we've done a lot of work with the federal programs at PPP um, and doing a lot of work with coaching and mentoring and FAQ development and one-on-one -on -one counseling to kind of get people ready to use those. But we're also seeing a wave of local government stepping up to support the businesses that are in their communities. Buncombe County has their one Buncombe fund. Soon afterwards, Haywood County launched a fund. Uh, the city of Shelby launched a fund. I know that we're seeing funds being talked about in several other communities. 
Um, I don't want to announce them before they're really ready to go. I know Transylvania tomorrow is another, another big one coming up right now. And so I think that we're really seeing communities saying, we believe in our people and we believe in our companies. And we know that a little bit goes a long way. Through the Growing Outdoors partnership, you've been in contact with a lot of manufacturers that were planning on manufacturing one set of things. And you've helped them to begin to, with some help from Dogwood Trust, uh, pivot to manufacturing something that people are buying right now. Can you talk a little bit about your uh, PPE work? Sure. Actually, Sarah Wood just commented on the uh, the Zoom webinar chat, so I want to just call her out. She's been fantastic. She's the chair of our North Carolina Outdoor Recreation Coalition, and she led the work to develop Supply Connector, which is um, when, when you know, partnership with a local web developer. And that is a platform, a very transparent platform, which differentiates it from a lot of what we're seeing out there, which is sort of a black box, like put in what you can make and we'll maybe tell you what you, who needs it. It's a transparent marketplace for PPE manufacturing um, that really started out uh, as, you know, with, a, with a, our network of outdoor industry companies and their suppliers in North Carolina. And now is a national movement. We're seeing fantastic uptake from across the country, nationwide, you know, um, trade associations and other statewide recreation coalitions and say directors of recreation are, are pointing towards that. Now we're seeing again that this is powerful because, you know, it connects PPE manufacturers to everybody who needs it, right? To all the essential service providers out there because in the end, a grocery store, right? Or an RN is just as important in many ways as a doctor because if you can't get your food to eat, we can't make it. And if you happen to get sick at the grocery store because they didn't have PPE, that doctor gets hammered, right? And so I think that's a fantastic effort from Supply Connector. And I think we've also seen some great examples of companies pivoting. Um, so two, two ones I could bring out really quickly. So the first one, I mentioned Kispo earlier. Again, they came from San Francisco. They landed here. They're just getting spun up and ready to go. COVID hit. They pivoted rapidly to making masks, working with the Carolina Textile District, which is a fantastic job on the textile side of things, really supporting companies to pivot to making PPE. I highly encourage folks to look at what they're doing. It's really exciting. Um, but also they saw four other manufacturers locally step up. So we saw a leather goods manufacturer come in to help with cutting and sewing, as well as a dry bag manufacturer making like kayaking dry bags. You saw a machine shop. Like a, a fab shop come in and say, all right, I can make you jigs to help you make your stuff. But also, you know what? I know about manufacturing, about how to turn things out a lot quicker at a high level of quality, right? They're talking about tolerances within like hundreds of an inch, thousands of an inch. And so they said, we can knock this out. And they saw production volumes ramp up just astronomically when they saw, well, bring their expertise to Donald's point, right? To bear on, on the work of other companies because they believed in the cause and believed in solving the crisis. Um, and then Sylvan Sport is a bigger company that really has taken, I've, I've, I know Tom Dempsey, the CEO, really well. And I think they've just been amazing in terms of continually pivoting from day one. I think it was a great quote from him. Um, you know, we're not just the type of team to go to accept circumstances, go home and wait. We solve things, right? And they've just been solving constantly. They started out making, you know, like bringing in shipments of masks and PPE from their partners in Asia they trade with. And then they work with their local supply chains here, which they have a really strong local source and 80% of their, of their go trailers is from local suppliers, right? Um, to start looking at, you know, what can we be making? They're making face shields to begin with, and they're using their, their kind of tent products to become isolation units, even now negative pressure isolation units, like medical grade isolation units for doing work with, these, with uh, people who are COVID positive. Like, it's just an example of companies that are tremendously innovative, that are right in our backyards, that are just to Donald's point, we're seeing those who have the capacity to be innovative just stepping up right now. Right. So we've got a group of people that have just immediately figured out a way to, to move into the breach and they're doing something immediately. You've yep. also made the point, and we run into danger of all these PPEs and PPDs and PPGs and, and PPP, you know, all, the, all those acronyms. But one of the things you've argued is that this is also a time for another set of companies perhaps to take a step back and uh, use the Paycheck Protection Program, the time that that buys them to 
pivot and rethink and, and not immediately act. Can you talk about that? Yeah, if you could talk to my slide, if you don't mind, that would be great for some, some core talking points. Um, so this is a call to arms, right? I've kind of coined a simple phrase, the great pause pivot project. So the great pause is one of the terms being used for this time right now. And the PPP is a program we're all pretty aware of, right? But I think there's a, 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 a missing piece in the marketing, Donald's point right now, right? That we need to shift the framing of what we're talking about, how we message matters so much, right? Imagine, and this is something Tom would be very familiar with with accelerator programs, imagine if we thought of the PPP not as like a, a life ring to cling on to for eight weeks, but as an eight week product market fit accelerator program, right? It's an amazing thing. We're looking at 600 plus billion dollars. Only the US government can do that, can fund that. We need to change from a survival mindset to an entrepreneurial mindset, one that can see and leverage opportunities to innovate and to evolve, right? We need to use this eight weeks as a runway for us to adapt to what the next year will look like. Because the reality is everybody's an entrepreneur now. We're all startups. I don't care how established you are, I don't care what sector you're in, whether you're in a hospital, you're in a university, local government, state government, federal government, or you're a business, right? From the Fortune 500s down to the little guys. We're all a startup again. I need to pivot constantly. And what that looks like in many ways is that we need to be stronger together because to, to Donald's point again, like we can't just be doing this by ourselves. There's no way we're all going to solve these big problems alone. We're all in uncertainty. So without you know, strong networks and shared solutions, we're all going to be fighting and struggling by ourselves and not really getting to shore and not building what we're going we're gonna to be building. Because this problem is just way too big for silos and too big for egos to get in the way. So I think there's just some fabulous examples of that happening. I'm really excited to see. I was on a call this month with two dozen arts nonprofits and businesses, all sharing resources to sustain, to sustain that industry, right? Again, those folks were by necessity coming together to share resources, not just ideas, but resources with one another and kind of help one another pivot. I already mentioned the Supply Connector. I think that's a great example of that. You know, the Asheville Area Food Guild, all these food manufacturers have just been a tremendous network for one another, helping one another recognize opportunities, solve problems. I think entrepreneurs are coming together. And, and because the reality is, it's easy to kind of look in that sort of very competitive mindset, but it's the ability to support one another gets through the hardest time to come. Bring us all back together around a slightly different question. One of the things that we've uh, seen and been talking about for a while is the importance of everybody being able to pivot in their mindset so that uh, more and more people think of their lives in an entrepreneurial way of reinventing themselves. And sometimes when we talk about entrepreneurs, we have this notion of uh, the lonely genius, uh, you know, Bill Gates coming up with this incredible idea all by himself. And so Part of this is a team thing that several of you have hit on. And part of it is the notion that entrepreneurial companies come in all forms. So there are all sorts of people who are relatively lower income hourly who've been laid off, but they're good at something. And maybe they've been thinking about something for a while. And I wonder if you could just speak to the idea that this is an opportunity for a variety of people. It's not just, uh, I don't know, college educated people who've been uh, been laid off. This is an opportunity for a lot of people who have a great idea to begin moving forward on that and maybe speak a little bit to what the first couple of steps of that might be based on your experience. Donald, early early thoughts. How do, how do you take an idea uh, when you first get it and, and turn it into something? Yeah, I mean, one of the things with being an entrepreneur is I have a great idea. Well, there's millions of those. Right, so how do you take a great idea and create something that's, that's useful and meaningful? And one of the best points of advice that I, I've gotten, which I'll share, is when you talk to 100 people about your idea, you're gonna know a couple things, right? You're gonna know what people are willing to pay for that idea. You're gonna know if it's relevant, and then you're gonna really understand if you can do it. And a lot of times people try to build something, try to get funding for something that they've not talked to enough people to see if they can actually articulate it clear enough 
for other people to understand, want to listen and participate either as a client, either as an investor or somebody that's just a cheerleader for their idea. So step one is socialize it a lot, right? Now, who do you socialize it with? People that have done something that you respect in a business way, right? That doesn't mean that good ideas or good feedback can't come from everywhere. But me personally, if I'm going to do something in the technology space, then I talk to people that are experts in technology-based businesses. When I was looking at building a marketing firm, I talked to people that were, had been there, done that in marketing. And so everybody's advice is not equal, is, is what I would say. Uh, and then the third thing is don't stop with that single idea. You're just flexing your creative muscle as you think about whether or not you want to be an entrepreneur. So try a lot. And one of the things that I feel, feel very strongly about is I have volumes of ideas and lots of them have been ridiculous failures. And then I find ones that work. One quick example is I used to run a talent management company. I thought I was going to be the next big superstar talent, bring marketing, agency, Hollywood, all together under run umbrella. I signed five clients. Figured out after about seven months, not going to be for me. But I met some amazing people in the process, and it's helped inform some of the things I do uh, on there. But that fear of failure, you got to let go and just try. Tom, what's maybe one one change that we could make that would um, unleash more people to do the kind of thinking Donald just talked about? What needs to change right now? I mean, I, I think it's, the, the way I'd characterize it is right now, there are going to be some people, I mean, obviously a bunch of people are being negatively impacted. Some people are going to find their superpower. And what I mean by that superpower is the entrepreneurial mindset. They're, you're, they're going to see um, this locus of control, which had been historically external, right? The world and life is something that happens to me. And then they'll pivot to an internal locus of control. You know, the psychologists use the word agency out of that. And when that happens, when your mindset shifts like that, you start seeing problems as opportunities, right? These are key points that, uh, as a matter of fact, sidebar and uh, promotional note, we teach in the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program where we have put down a goal to get 100,000 people in the state through this curriculum to empower them with an entrepreneurial mindset. And it's, you know, it's critical thinking, it's problem solving, it's collaboration, right? It's all those things. And for those people that do it for the first time, I'm, I'm usually quite jealous because it's fascinating. It's like a, a child on Christmas morning um, when they learn this new, again, superpower, right? That they can look at this and say, you know, they shed that learned helplessness and they say, you know, I'm going to do something proactive and it's very empowering, right? Because we give them the tool set to say, okay, it's scary. Yes, but it's not insurmountable. And so like, let's break it down. And how do I bring a new product or solution to the market that I see is, you know, affecting thousands of people. That's why we see resilience from companies that start during these downturns because they have to figure that out. And then the final kind of uh, characteristic or trait that I would just suggest broadly is at this time, and it, this also applies to people that aren't going to go pursue something entrepreneurial, is empathy. Empathy for all of us. Empathy for each other. You know, the companies that have done that, that can be empathetic to their clients' needs. There, there's a genuineness that comes out. It shows and it reflects as an investment in relationships that long-term pay off. And when we started, my, my last startup we did uh, right after 9-11, nobody had the blueprint on what do you do if you started a company on September 12, 2001, right? An agency, no doubt. Donald can, can attest to this, right? Nobody was spending money, you know, on marketing because they were afraid, right? Yet I went out there, you know, and I knocked on doors and I got, you know, we were fortunate to get a couple of Fortune 500 brands to work with us. And I was honest. And, you know, and I just said... I know you guys are scared. We're scared. I'm trying to make payroll, you know, but let's work through this together. And those relationships, you know, 20 years later are still with the agency. So I think a little vulnerability out there and having that empathy for each other will go a long way. I spent a lot of time. I went down, I was used to be with the UNC system office. And in 2010, we went down to Charlotte and the idea was that there were a lot of people out there who had never been entrepreneurs before. And some of them were bankers who'd been laid off and some of them were uh, plumbers who'd been laid off. And there are some uh, curricula that are out there. You've mentioned the Ice House curriculum. 
like to just show a slide. There's some other support agencies that are out there for different kinds of businesses uh, that provide support. The Small Business Technology Development Centers are mostly based at universities in the state, and they've done a great job over the years in getting some early curriculum out to people who are thinking about being entrepreneurs. They also support early stage companies. Uh, Community College Small Business Center Network, uh, again, is ubiquitous. It's, it's based on community college campuses. They're out there. The Council for Entrepreneurial Development also has support services. So there are a number of these uh, resources out there, including Mountain BizWorks, uh, which does great work in the western part of our state. Um, Noah, as we close, what are some closing thoughts maybe you have about um, what needs to happen next if, if we're going to come out of this successfully? Don, I'm waiting out the storm. Um, and when we emerge, we're going to be in a new landscape, and the destination we were kind of heading towards that has changed as well. And I think that kind of those who are able to have an entrepreneurial mindset are going to be able to set their compass bearings for a new destination and find excitement in that in that journey. This is again, this is a journey, not an event. It's not going to be a one-time thing. To our points earlier from Tom and from Donald, this is not going to happen and be gone. But America is founded on venturing into the unknown. That's our our collective story as a country. Almost every family has a story of someone triumphing over uncertainty in a new place and a new land in a destination they couldn't really imagine before they got there. And so it's our job to do the same thing. This is our collective moment as a country to turn around and really find that entrepreneurial spirit, that pioneering spirit, um, and to triumph over adversity and to start new things and to try and to fail and to learn from that on the journey and to end up in a place we're excited about. Donald, are you optimistic about where we're heading and how we're gonna come out of this? I 100% am, and I just am not built any other way. And one of the things that I'm thankful, number one, for you having me uh, and giving me a chance to share, but number two, the reason for that optimism is I'm just a believer in the entrepreneurial mentality overcoming adversity. And to Noah's point, hey, this is our moment, right? There's a lot of negative things happening too, but you don't become a champion without an opportunity to prove it and demonstrate it where other people can watch. Like that's the only way that you become a champion is to be able to have something in your story that says that you overcame. And so for me, this is able to write another chapter in my story, but more importantly, it's for people on my team and companies I'm invested in that I get to cheer and help them with their story. I've got a couple of pieces in my story that says, hey, I'm gonna be okay, right? But to rise up and see a few other people take that mantle and say, I'm gonna make it, I'm going to figure it out. This pain is going to toughen me, not break me, is really an emotional thing for me. Because once you do it one time, then you can help others with the next crisis that comes or the next thing that people overcome. And so I'm really excited about the future in the midst of the reality that we have to deal with right, right, right now today. All right. Thanks to you all for being with us. Our guests today have been Donald Thompson, the CEO of Walk West, uh, Noah Wilson, with Mountain BizWorks and Tom Rue, the CEO of NC Idea. Really appreciate all of you being with us today. Next week, we'll be focusing on law enforcement and the courts. We'll have as our guests, Sherry Beasley, the Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, Colonel Glenn McNeil, the head of the State Highway Patrol, and Fred, Fred Ferrer, the Vice President for Technology with the Public Consulting Group. Excited to have all of them. Um, with us next week. If you'd like to reach us, if you have ideas for future shows, please contact me, LN Boney at ncsu.org. For shows and show notes, they'll be posted tomorrow. This show will be, uh, the recorded version of it will be posted tomorrow at emergingissues.org. Special thanks to the home improvement retailer Lowe's for their sponsor sponsorship of today's programs and the programs over the next month. We're honored to have their support. We're also honored to have the help of a huge uh, uh, and highly capable staff. First and Future is produced by Greg Hedgepath and James Herrick. Podcast versions produced by James Herrick. Kirsten Chang promotes the show. Special thanks to Renee Potts for her help with slides and to Caitlin Lancaster and Trishel Moore for their research on today's episode. 
Thanks to all of you for joining us each week. If you'd like to subscribe, you can do that on our website. I'm Leslie Bundy. As the head of IEI, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us and on, on behalf of our entire staff at NC State's Institute for Emerging Issues. Please stay safe. We'll see you in the future.